This morning I'm going to uh, speak about you have what it takes. <laughs> you have what it takes. It's, you know, what's the commercial or whatever? It's in there. What's Prego. Yeah, it's in there. You know, if you want, you want the sauce, don't worry about it. It's in there. Well, if we think about our life, that God has already given to us what we need. I remember when doing the um, of creation, how the God has created this planet, and he has made it a big storehouse so that the earth contains everything we need to live on. So as the industrial age and whatever, solar the, from the sun, whatever, God has created everything that we need to live. And we say, you know, people will ask, well, what about the starving in all these countries? And, well, if you really think about it, it's either the greed of individuals or it's their religion. <laughs> the greed of people or their faith is what causes some of the some of the droughts and the, the deaths of so many people. You know, um, in India, they consider it a, um, how can I say it? They, they do not help their poor. And the whole poor of their society is left untaken care of because they believe in reincarnation and that these individuals are, have been reincarnated from their previous life somewhere and this poverty that they are going through and this pain that they are going through is part of their progression in the chain of, re, uh, of reincarnation so that when they die they will come back as a higher life form if they do the right things in this, this place that they're at. So they won't help them. And then you couple that with all the, you know, that um, they may be coming back as a rat, as a monkey, as an animal. So you don't kill rats, monkeys, animals. They have temples to the rats. Did you know that? They have temples to the rats, and they have priests to the rats, and they will actually sit there in this temple of rats and have them crawl all over them and take care of them like you would take care of a cat or a dog. And, of course, the animals, the cows and things, can ramble through streets and whatever. You can't touch them or kill them. You can push them away, but, you know, this might be your relative. So you don't mess with the cows, you know, and the monkeys. And so there's just, this, this is a real problem. <laughs> and whenever, we are, whenever our religion, this is Dave McGee philosophy here, whenever our religion interferes with our ability to care for people, then we have a problem. Then we have a problem. And I, I think of um, years ago, there was a, a group or... Uh, that would had individuals in the hospital, and they would come in and pray for them, and then you would call them back and say, you know, you're so-and-so, they're not doing well, they would like for you to come back, and they said, we can't do anything, we're not coming back. <laughs> what? What do you mean you're not coming back? These people need you. Well, we did what we could, they're still sick, and they're not going to get better, so uh, we can't do anything for them, and we'll walk away from them. Because their faith said one thing and what happened said another, so therefore they wouldn't challenge their faith. They would just abandon the people. Sometimes I think we mistakenly have the same approach about ourselves and, or about God. That if we make a mistake, God has just, <laughs> you know, you, you've just made one too many mistakes and God is done with you. Well, if God were done with you, you wouldn't be in church, you wouldn't be alive, you would be someplace else <laughs> than living. So God isn't done with us. His grace and his mercy are continually reaching out to us, and he has placed in us the reserves, the storehouse, the abilities to do what we do. Now, you might not be where you need to be just yet in your developmental phase or stages of life, um, your, your, I, I know we mentioned this, Anne's boy, what is his? Plasma, okay, here's, now here's her, uh, Anne's your cousin, niece. Anne is your niece and her, her son just got his doctorate at 28 in plasma, physics, plasma, he, 
You know, and actually what it, in some respects, it is, major, it is measuring the dust that comes from plasma, plasma and it's, it's some way out there. Now, he wasn't able to do that whenever he was 18. <laughs> he, was, he, had, he graduated high school at 16, and he was in college when he was very young, finished his college degree and finished his doctorate and all of this. Now, the idea is he became, and where he's going, he's not finished with yet. And did he know whenever he was 17 that he was going to be doing research in, in plasma? Not really. Did, did you know you would be doing what you're doing today 10 years ago? Not really. We don't, we, don't, we don't know all of the things that are in front of us, but what we do know is God is with us at this moment, and he is leading us onward and leading us to where he wants us to be. Now, in Luke chapter 6, Beginning at verse 6, um, Jesus is uh, teaching in the synagogue. He says, on, on, on another Sabbath, he went to the meeting place and taught. So, Jesus is teaching. What Jesus teaches us is very important because it gives us direction for our life, not only this life, but the life to come. Now, Whenever he is teaching us, he, then he comes along, in this case, he is teaching and he wants the people to understand that who he is and why he has come. But, you know, he not only has words, he has the miracles to back it up. So Jesus has been teaching and there was a man there with a crippled right hand. So we know that it was a crippled right hand. Now, um, whenever I think of this, I think of it as an individual that I, I've seen that had a crippled hand, it was like at the wrist, and there's a crippled right hand. But I've also seen individuals that their entire arm is withered to the point that it's nothing that they can do with. It's hardly, it's something that they wrap around them or hold inside, and it's not even, doesn't even have the strength to be able to move. I know an individual that their, their right arm is something that they just flop. They pick it up, hold it, put it on the table. There is no strength in that arm. So whenever Jesus is saying here he's a crippled right hand, I don't know if it's just from his wrist down that he's crippled, that his fingers are unfunctional, or whether his entire arm is totally non-functional. That this person that I know that their arm is there and they swing it and they put it on the table, they can't move it. The only way they can move it is with their other hand. So whether this is the situation or not, but we know that this person has a crippled right hand. Okay, the religious scholars and Pharisees had their eye on Jesus to see if he would heal the man. Did you ever have people watch you to wait and look for your failure? <laughs> look for something that is wrong. That they are looking for a mistake. In the, whole, in the whole framework, I remember a guy worked at the, at the and lived, lived at the farm with us, and uh, his first, you know, he, we, he knew that, found out very quickly, that we were very religious and went to church all the time and so on, and he wouldn't go to church with us, and he says, well, you know, I just got one question. If I could have this question answered, I'd go to church. I thought, okay, what's, you know, what's the question? What's this What's this question that keeps you from going through the doors of a church? What is this one question that keeps your faith from going to accept Jesus Christ? He said, where did Cain get his wife? I said, what? You know, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel and he has kids. Where did he get her? I said, that's your question? Well, <laughs> I... I kind of laughed and, you know, we talked about it and went on. And, but you see, people, and, and if they will find, if you find one question, you'll find another. If you find one doubt, you'll find another, because there is an answer. Sometimes the answer isn't what we want it to be. Sometimes the answer isn't what we think it'll be. Sometimes the answer is completely beyond what we have. 
I like the one individual said, did you ever eat a steak? T-bone steak. Did you ever eat a T-bone steak? How many of you ate the bone? <laughs> no. You eat the meat and leave the bone. There are things in our life that we just don't understand. And so they are, we eat and we understand and take what we do know and know that God will help us understand those things that we don't. Well, here is these individuals, and they're, wa they're watching Jesus. They've listened to his teachings. And they are not interested in his teachings. They are interested in, is he going to heal this person on the Sabbath? So, the next <coughs> portion of the verse says, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. You see, these individuals had written laws that just basically it was almost a sin to breathe on a Sunday, on a Saturday, on the Sabbath. That if you breathed wrong on the Sabbath, they were going to call you a heretic and they were going to cause you know, all kinds of trouble for you. So they're watching Jesus to see if he's going to heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus, he knew what they were up to, and he spoke to the man with the crippled hand, get up and stand here before us. So here is the situation. This man, Jesus, has been teaching. These people are standing around, you know, wondering what he's going to do next. You know, he's, that's, you know, let's just watch. I'm sure we're going to catch him in something that's really wrong. And so Jesus tells the man with the withered hand, Stand up and stand here before us. Now, here's the challenge. What is he going to do? What is he going to make that person do that he's not capable of doing? You know? Is he going to make him walk on water? Is he going to levitate? <laughs> is he going to, you know, what's he going to do? What's he going to make him happen? What's going to happen next? Well, Jesus addressed the Pharisees here. He says to these Pharisees, let me ask you a question. What kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Okay, what is there about this day, this holy day, that is of honoring God and keeping his commands? What is there about this day that suits this day the best? Doing good or doing evil? Okay, doing good or doing evil? Helping people? or leaving them helpless. <laughs> when we are moved with compassion, moved with an idea to help, moved with an idea to become something that we're not, learning, growing, developing, whether it be physically, spiritually, mentally, whether it's, you know, activities, whether it's school, whether it's <laughs> learning a new job, Whatever it is, when we're learning, what is it that we're moved by? What takes hold of our heart and helps us look beyond the moment? That will, will we be helping people or leaving them helpless? So that what we are doing has, an, has a motive for making life different or better for someone. He looked around and he looked at each one of those Pharisees and he looked them in the eye. Okay? Which is it? Is it better to help or leave people helpless? And he looked at each one of them. Okay? Looked them in the eye. He was waiting for an answer. They never answered. They didn't say anything. They just kind of stood there. Because if they would have said, well, leave people helpless, <laughs> you know, that wouldn't have fit who they thought they were. But to help people, well, that has some restrictions. So, Jesus was trying to move them from their judgmental self-righteousness. He was trying to move them from being so judgmental to helping. They had turned God into a judgmental God who is not, you know, the, the plaque says the eyes of God are upon you. Okay, you got this plaque, put it in your house. The eyes of God are upon you. Okay, what is he doing? What is he watching for? 
What is God looking for? He's watching over you. Is he, find, is he looking for your faults? Or is he looking to mark down all the ways that he helps, can help, is helping? You know, it's like the, the joke, uh, this guy breaks into a house, and uh, he's you know, got his little flashlight, and he's looking around, and, and he hears this voice, Jesus is watching you. And he's startled, you know, and he shines the light, and there's a parrot. <laughs> and uh, he goes, oh, wow. And, he says, and the parrot says, Jesus is watching you. <laughs> and the guy laughs, wow, Jesus is watching you. And the, and, and, the parrot, and the guy says to the parrot, well, what's your name? He says, Moses. Moses? Who's dumb enough to name their parrot Moses? And the parrot replies, the same one who's dumb enough to name their dog Jesus. <laughs> he turns and there's Jesus, the dog, coming after him, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. <laughs> so, Jesus looks around and he looks at them and he wants them to understand, okay, that it, God is not this judgmental person. He is this God who wants to be involved in our life. And so what does Jesus tell the man? He says, hold out your hand. Okay, everybody, just hold out your right hand. Okay, that's it. The guy who couldn't move his, whether it was his hand or whether it was his entire arm, all he does is, and it's healed. Boom. Right in front of everyone, in front of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the critics, those who are looking to find fault. He did it. He broke the Sabbath. <laughs> How difficult is it to reach out your right hand? All you're doing, all you did was listen to me, and something miraculous happened. You, ra you, you lifted your hand. Um, so, Nancy, I know, I don't usually pick, I usually pick on these two up here, <laughs> but you were the only, would you please stand, okay? Now, what I want you to do is to reach into your commentary and give me $20, <laughs> oh, what's, what's wrong? Huh? The commentary there? Don't you have a commentary? Now reach in there and give me $20. There's not $20 in there. Oh, there's not $20 in there. Do you believe in me? Yeah? Do you believe that I would mislead you? Okay. Open up your commentary and give me $20. No, go to the front. Go to the front. You were the only one I could get to and put the $20 in there. <laughs> and you're the only one I knew would give it back to me. You know, <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, Brian, Brian, Brian will take it. All right, now, you can sit down. Okay, the question is, every, you know, everything Jesus would ask of us, he's already given us before he asks us. See, the natural response is, there's no $20 in my, there's no $20 in my commentary. You know, I didn't put it, you know, you would think, you know, Nancy is saying, I didn't put it there. There's no $20 in there. You're mistaken. He's just making a fool out of me. That's what he's doing. <laughs> no. When Jesus tells the crippled to take his hand and extend it out, is he trying to make a fool of the man or is he going to heal the man? And see, in our lives, we have that same, was the pastor trying to, but you see, God has already put inside of us everything that we need to do to be who we are. God had put inside of Rhonda's niece's son the ability to do this, <laughs> measure the dust in a plasma as it I don't know how it works, but he can measure it. Now, God has put that in him, but he had to learn and bring that out. God has placed in you the abilities to be who you are. I was, I was listening to um, 
Joel Osteen, <laughs> kind of is my new favorite speaker. Um, but he was doing this talk show with he and his mother. And his mother said, and this is one of the things that I, I, I was really caught back with, that this individual, Joel, he, has, he had only ever spoken one time before he felt God called him to be the pastor of that church. And when he told his mother that God had called him to be the pastor of that church, she was like, Joel, <laughs> are you sure? Because when he spoke up the first time, he was so nervous and scared, he could hardly get behind the pulpit because he had only ever spoken in public once before. And he was going to take on this whole thing of the ministry of his father. And you see, inside of each of us, there is the ability to do things. And when God says, I want you to do this, we say, well, Nancy, open the book. Well, there's no, well, there's no $20 in my book. But you see, we would say that to ourselves. That, that ability isn't in me. That ability isn't there. Because I know I don't have it. That's correct. God put it there. God put it there. God put the need, whatever you need, whatever you have to do with your life, and God is calling you to do it. God has already put within you what is necessary for you to open up. <laughs> open up. Hand Extend your right hand. And the miracle was taken care of. The miracle happened. And what happens next? Um, they were beside themselves. Verse 11. They were beside themselves with anger. They were so angry. These people who were watching Jesus were so angry that this guy's hand was healed. You know you're off course when you can't be happy with the people who are happy. <laughs> when you cannot rejoice with the people who are rejoicing, you need to check the barometer inside, the thermostat inside. You need to check it because if you can't rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, it's time to check in and find out what's going on in your heart. And these people were so angry at Jesus, they couldn't find a way to discredit him. They couldn't find a way to make him look bad by what he had just done. They had been watching. They had been listening. Jesus knew what they were up to, and he tells the man to stand up. What's so sinful about standing up? What's so sinful about standing in front of everybody? And sometimes whenever we're in the spotlight, when pastor calls you and you have to stand up, <laughs> I told Tyler and Dylan about the candle. They had to have it. You know, I was going to do them that again today. And they said, are you? <laughs> when pastor puts you in the spotlight, what happens? Well, when God puts us in the spotlight, and sometimes there's no one else around but you. <laughs> sometimes the spotlight is whenever you're all alone and God says, stand up. God says, stick out your hand. <laughs> Go over to your neighbor and help them out. <laughs> Go to your neighbor and don't criticize your neighbor. Don't criticize them. Help them. When God says, do the little things. You see, those are the things that God is working at in our lives to help us become, to get over that fear factor that we're not capable of doing something. You see, what is it that we're not capable of doing? Well, this, this man with a crippled hand, he wasn't capable of using his right hand. He was incapable of using it. What are we incapable of doing? And when we respond to the word, 
something happens on the inside. When we respond to the word, something happens inside of our heart, makes us different. Whenever we feel like we have sinned, we ask God to forgive us of our sins and live within our heart, there's something miraculous that takes place. There's something miraculous that takes place in our lives. We're forgiven. When we don't know what to do, and we ask Jesus to help us, and we do something, maybe it's the same old thing, maybe it's something we do something entirely different. But God is helping to lead us and guide us to our next step. There's an illustration, <laughs> a story. I've been carrying it around here for about four or five weeks and never got to it. But um, sometimes when we think of what we have, we don't have enough. Okay? We don't have enough. Well, for a lot of people, winning the lottery is the American dream. But for many lottery winners, there's, just, there's a TV show coming on about 20 lottery winners that have just gone bazonkers with billions of dollars. But that's only very few. Um, most people end up being in bankruptcy and losing everything. Winning the lottery isn't always what it's cracked up to be, says Evelyn Adams, who won the New Jersey lottery not just once, but twice. 1985 and 1986, to the tune of $5.4 million. Today, the money is all gone, and Adams lives in a trailer. I won the American dream, but lost it too. It was, very, it was a very hard fall. It, it's called rock bottom. Everybody wants my money. Everybody had their hand out. I never learned one important word in the English, English language. No. <laughs> I wish I had the chance to do it all over again. I'd be much smarter about it, says Adams, who, who also lost money at the slot machines in Atlantic City. I was a big-time gambler, says Adams. I didn't, I didn't drop a million dollars, but it was a lot of money. I made mistakes, some I regret and some I don't. I can't go back now, so I just go forward. <laughs> you see, in our lives, we think that, and that's, that's kind of what the lottery system is all about, that somehow, some way, we're going to fall into something. Most of the time when we fall into something, we fall out of it. <laughs> because we don't know how to appreciate what is the gift that has been given to us, and so we don't appreciate the miracle that has been given in our own lives whenever we put out our hand. Put out your hand, David, not as a handout, but as giving something to someone else. Put out your hand. Giving what you have and what you, what's part of who you are, that's the miracle that God has given us, the miracle to become someone and to appreciate how we got where we're at. How that we are able to look at life and be thankful. You know, one other scripture that I want to look at is uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 33. It says, have you ever come on anything quite like the extravagant generosity of God? Have you ever come across anything so extravagant as the generosity of God? No. No. God is not some stingy, greedy person withholding. He, can't, he wants to give to his children, but you know what? We can't get it. <laughs> we can't receive what God wants to give. Now, I, I know I've told this story a long time ago, but hey, I'm old and I'm senile. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm young and I have a great mind. Okay, so the, you, know how to, you know how to catch a monkey, right? You know how to catch a monkey? Grab it, yeah. <laughs> Grab it by the neck, right? Now, how you catch a monkey is you, t you put a barrel out in the, in the woods there or whatever, put bananas on the inside, and you drill holes in the side, big enough for them to stick their paws, hands in there. What they will do is they will put their hands in, they will grab hold of the banana, and they're caught. Why? 
they won't let go. That's why the extravagant generous, generousness of God is so hard to give to us is because our hands are already full. And we won't let it go. You see, we need to look at things, we need to be wise in our understanding of life and the gifts and everything we have. We, we, we need to let go of some things. You know, if it's not working, let it go. If you haven't wore, worn something in five years, it's time to get it out of your closet. Let somebody else wear it. Stuff I wore five years ago, I can't wear because it's too small. But anyhow, <laughs> I'm waiting to get, grow back into it. But uh, I ran into a guy yesterday, and he, I said hello, and he says hello, and he says, boy, you've gained weight. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you too. Um, <laughs> have you ever run into anything quite like the extravagant generosity of God? This deep, deep wisdom of God is in the generousness that he has to us. God doesn't beat us into getting smart. He gives to us until we're intelligent enough to use it. Hello. He keeps giving and giving and giving. You see, he gives us forgiveness until we understand forgiveness. He gives us love until we begin to understand how much love, how valuable love is. He gives to us wisdom and understanding and insight. He gives all this to us until we begin to understand how much greater our life is. And I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a favor that God has asked him for his advice? I used to say that God has a flat forehead because when I prayed, I would tell him what to do. And God would go, oh, David, never thought of that. <laughs> you know, that's this one here. Anyone who's done such favors for God, he, God has to ask them. God, <laughs> when we pray, we are giving to God our life in exchange for his answers. We are giving to God our sins, our failures in exchange for his forgiveness and love and grace and mercy. You see, we are giving away, letting go of what is wrong to receive what is right. And then everything comes from God, everything happens through him, and everything ends up in him. Everything. Everything comes from him. The good, the bad, and the not so good. <laughs> everything can find its way. Now, God is not the originator of everything. Um, I know I need to quit, but I, I like the idea of Job. Excuse me. Satan, Satan says, have you considered Job? You know, there, you know, look at Job. And God says, have you considered my faith, ser servant Job? And, and, and Satan says, I can't touch him. I c Satan is saying this to God. What's he saying? I can't touch him. Why? There's a hedge around him that God has put in place. And Satan can't get to him. And the only way that Satan can get to Job is if God removes the hedge. And when God removes the hedge, it is for his glory and his honor. And Job goes through the trials. And that's why when we pray about our own lives and pray about the lives of others, we pray God put a hedge around them. We pray God put a hedge around our lives. Give us wisdom and understanding in all of this thing. Help us to extend our right hand that what we need to do to find the healing that needs to take place in our bodies and in our mind, in our soul, in our spirit, the wounded places of our heart need to be healed. Then, God asks us to stand up, like I did to Nancy, stand up 
and inside and give me your give me a twenty dollar bill that's inside of the book. Well, I don't have it, but you see, what God calls you to do, it's already in there. He wouldn't ask you for it if it wasn't there. <laughs> Shall we stand? <laughs> so. <laughs> What's God asking of us? He's asking for us to be, in, in all things, give thanks. To be grateful people. To be thankful people. To be blessed people. You know, to honor, be honor, honoring others and honoring God with our lives. To allow his greatness to be part of who we are, our thinking. You know, our hearts, our doing, our going out. You know, being able to Speak to people. Oh, I can't speak. What? <laughs> I can't do this. What? Whatever God asks us to do, it's already in there. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the gifts you've given us. And Lord, just let the truth of your word filter into our hearts and minds that we might change, we might become what you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We receive it. <laughs> Amen? We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.